This is Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. This is a gentleman I remember playing for the Seattle Seahawks. Going across the middle of the field, he could not be stopped. He's in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, former Seattle Seahawks, Steve Largent. How are you doing, Mr. Largent? I'm doing very well. I see you went to school at Tulsa. I know you're from Tulsa, but I thought everybody, the top players in Oklahoma, all went to Oklahoma back at that time. Well, you know, I would have loved to have gone to OU, but uh, they were running the wishbone at that time, and I was a receiver even in high school. And uh, so there wasn't a lot of uh, prospect for catching many passes at OU. And, and they also uh, signed Tinker Owens that year. Did you follow Tulsa football growing up in the days of Howard Twilley and the Jerry Rome and all that stuff? You know, my grandfather did, and he was a big influence in my life uh, when I was making this decision about where I was going to go to college. And so he had really encouraged me to consider the University of Tulsa. And uh, then when they ended up offering me a scholarship, uh, it was a done deal. And then you go to the Seattle Seahawks, who were an expansion team. That would be a change for you. Well, the reality is, if you know the backstory, uh, that was that I was drafted by the Houston Oilers in the fourth round that year, and they uh, cut me. They they released me, and I was uh, packed my bags and headed home and looking for work. Uh, that's when the Seahawks called me the same week and said, hey, we want to give you another chance. And it turns out they ended up working out a trade, uh, but it was really after I was already told by Bum Phillips that uh, I wasn't good enough to play in the Oilers organization. Did you have much interaction with Tom Phillips other than him telling you goodbye? <laughs> not very much. Uh, I really didn't. Um, you know, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I was not a good rookie player. Uh, I didn't. I didn't really know how to study. I didn't know how to prepare myself uh, for practices or for games. And so it was a real learning experience for me uh, going through the process that I did. Actually, being released by one team and <clears throat> getting a second chance in Seattle. And then uh, I did everything I could to take advantage of the chance I had. With Seattle, there had to be a change for you because, I mean, you're going from Oklahoma out to Washington. I mean, from, in essence, down south to the east, I mean, to the west coast there. And you have, what, Jim Zorn is your quarterback. But, again, no one knew what to expect with Seattle. Well, that's right. And, and I knew uh, when I came into uh, the locker room at Seattle that it was a different situation because even the veterans in training camp that year had their names on tape on their helmets. So nobody knew anybody. Uh, everybody was vying for a position. And, um, you know, the, the real um, uh, key for me making that team that year was the fact that Jerry Rome had come from the University of Tulsa, my alma mater, that same year to become the quarterback and receiver coach in Seattle. And he was the guy that really convinced the Seahawks to to get me after I was released uh, by the Oilers and give me a chance. And so uh, when I came up to Seattle, the, the, the key for me was the fact that we were running the old University of Tulsa uh, playbook, uh, essentially. We ran all the same um, uh, pass plays in Tulsa for three years. So I knew the, the game plan in terms of the, the, the passing attack uh, with the Seahawks the first day I stepped on the field, and that was a real advantage for me. I would assume another advantage was starting off with a young quarterback like Jim Zorn, and being able to develop some sort of uh, relationship that you you know see nowadays so much, especially in Chicago, they talk about Jay Cutler and Brandon Marshall and that relationship that the two have. Is that something that came about quickly? Well, it, it, it really did. Uh, Jim and I became uh, fast friends and, and teammates as well, and he's the best friend to this, this day. Uh, so there was just a connection that we had that is unusual for quarterbacks and receivers to have in that our relationship was one that carried over beyond just the playing field uh, and the locker room. So uh, I think that really was instrumental in both of our development as players with the Seahawks. But uh, Jim was actually vying for a starting job as a quarterback, and I was doing the same thing as a receiver. And uh, we, we just kind of connected because we were both guys that liked to work hard, uh, stay late for practice, uh, work on things after the coaches had blown the whistles and all the other players are headed into the uh, locker room. We were still out there uh, working on routes and uh, catching balls and, and uh, just throwing the ball as much as we could. And I think that that really worked as an advantage for both Jim and myself. 
Because your coach, uh, Jack Patera, he was a gambling type guy. He didn't run the traditional NFL offense at that time. It was wide open more. He said, I had to take chances if I wanted to win. Well, that's right. And, and we, we, of course, in his first year coaching, didn't win very many games. And so he was willing to do anything, including, you know, running uh, fake field goals and, and punts and things like that just to try to keep the ball and uh, move it down the field and try to get the end zone. And uh, actually, in Jack's first several years that he coached, uh, the one aspect that worked well was the offense. Uh, defensively, we had more struggles. But offensively, we put a lot of points on the board most of the time. So, um, you know, it, 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 was, it was really fun to play uh, on that team because we had a lot of great veteran players that had come from other teams that uh, could tell us stories about uh, the way they did it in Miami or Cleveland or Dallas or wherever it was they were from. And, uh, and yet there was a, a good core nucleus of young players, the Sherman Smiths and Dave Browns of the world, that uh, uh, you could really bond with. And, and you knew that they were winners, even though we didn't win that often in Seattle. You won more games, though, than Tampa did that first year. We did. We, we were 2-12. and 12. We played 14 games in the regular season at that time. And I don't think uh, Tampa won a game. We, in fact, we, one, of the, one of the two wins we had was against Tampa. So we were not very good, but we were better than Tampa. <laughs> As a rookie, you lead the team in receptions. At the end of the season, do you say to yourself, okay, I, I figured this all out, or do you realize that there's a lot more to this game that you haven't figured out? No, you know, I, my attitude was always, how do we win? Uh, it was not how many passes I caught. And so uh, I worked just as hard, you know, uh, in the off season after the first season as I, as I hopefully worked before the, uh, my first season in the NFL. But I think I worked harder and smarter after the first season uh, to try to improve as a team. Uh, it was never about how good can I get. It was about how can we get better as a team. And uh, that was always my focus every year I played. And then, what, your third year in the league, I mean, you guys made the playoffs. You were 9-7, and seven, Pateras coach the year. You had to think you were on to something. Well, we should have made the playoffs. We didn't. Uh, we were 9-7 and seven after that third year. We were 9-7 and seven after the fourth year, uh, which was pretty incredible back then. We were playing in the AFC West with the Oakland Raiders and Denver Broncos and San Diego Chargers and Kansas City Chiefs, all which had good teams. Uh, but we were very competitive, and uh, – uh, so we, we felt like we were right on the cusp of becoming uh, a real playoff contender type team. Uh, and then the wheels kind of fell off after the third year. In 80, you go four and 12 and yep. 81, you go six and 10 and Dave Krieg ent enters the picture. What's the situation like for a receiver when all of a sudden, you know, you have this relationship with Zorn and another quarterback's on the scene. Well, actually, what ha happened was after the eighty two in, in the middle of the eighty two season, uh, they fired Jack Patera, and uh, so we lose our head coach. Uh, Jim's still playing through eighty two, but eighty three is when uh, he really began being challenged. And what happened was, I think it was in the eighty two season, might have been eighty one, he broke his ankle, and Jim was never the same after he broke his ankle. He wasn't as mobile as he had been for the previous five, six, seven years. And when Jim was not mobile, that really uh, hurt us as a team and hurt him as a player. And uh, the, the Seahawks began eyeing other quarterbacks, and Dave Craig came in uh, about 82, 83, and uh, started contending for the starting position, which he eventually took in, uh, by the end of 83, I think it was. That's when you had Chuck Knox as your coach. You had yourself, you had Kurt Warner in the backfield, you had Dave Craig, and, and then you became a playoff team. That's right. Uh, Chuck Knox came in in 83 and uh, really turned our team around. He, he, he got a few veteran players from other team uh, on, our, on our team, and uh, he really inspired the, the young guys and, and myself. Uh, we knew this was a guy that knew how to win, knew how to get into the playoffs, and uh, we all thought he was going to take us there. We didn't know it was going to be the first year. But uh, he drafted Kurt Warner in the first round out of Penn State, and Kurt came in and just had an outstanding year. He ran the ball just great. I think he had I don't know, 12, 1,300 yards rushing uh, and uh, really played you know, just great football. And it was really a fun year to, to turn around uh, what had been uh, going through a couple of dismal years uh, to, to really be in a playoff contender uh, that first year under, Jack, under uh, Chuck Knox. How did uh, Chuck Knox differ from the previous coaches? I think it was just the fact that he had experience. It's really important, I think, for a team to believe in a coach. 
and the fact that Chuck had been there, uh, he had uh, he had he had, he had coached teams that were a championship level team. Uh, he knew how it was to be done, and uh, and and so he began implementing what he thought needed to be done within Seattle immediately. And so everybody just had a lot of confidence in him and his coaching ability and his coaching staff. And I think that really did lend a lot uh, to our team that we the, that we were missing before Chuck got there. A lot was made in 1982 when you decided after, what, the third week to come out there and play again and uh, go across the picket lines. What was the reasoning for doing that? Well, 82, I decided to do that, but never got to. Uh, as you know, the NFL owners locked out the players, so there was never even an opportunity to go in. And, and my personal philosophy was that I had signed a contract with the Seattle Seahawks, not with the Players Association, and that my ob- my first obligation was to the team that I'd signed the contract with. And so I just felt under an obligation uh, to play. And uh, And yet, as I said, in 82... Uh, there were no replacement games. That was in 87. 87, that's uh, right. I apologize. I got confused yeah. with the years. Yeah, so that, in 82, I, I did the same thing I did in 87. I said I felt obligated to play, um, and and but there was no opportunity. In 87, there was an opportunity because there were replacements. But I went in to, to play uh, in the first game when they had replacement players, and the ownership actually came to me and said, Steve, we don't want you to come in. Uh, we want you to stay out and let this process work it out because we don't want to disrupt uh, the positive momentum we have as a team right now. So I listened to him. I said, okay, I'm not going to do that. Uh, but then it got at, at the end of the strike. Um, they said there was a deal, and they said there wasn't a deal. And, they said, well, and so the owners had erected a, you know, a, a superficial timeline that if you weren't in by this certain time, you couldn't play in the game the following week. And so I reported uh, for the last game uh, of the replacement players in 87. I played in that game in Detroit. But Joe Montana did the same thing. He basically walked across because he wanted to sit there and play. Yeah, I, I, think, I think all of us were frustrated with the deliberations or lack of deliberations and lack of resolution to the situation. But, and you know, in my situation, 87, that was like uh, my 10th year in the league or maybe 12th year in the league. And, you know, I knew that I didn't have very many years left. In fact, I was playing on borrowed time at that time. So, uh, you know, the fact that we were uh, under a union that was striking uh, was really penalizing me, uh, the opportunity to play in what I viewed my, my, my kind of my, uh, the, the twilight of my career. How, how did that impact your relationship with your teammates? Uh, I think with the overwhelming majority of them, it didn't impact uh, my teammates because everybody reported, literally everybody reported two days after I did. Uh, but because they had come in after the deadline, they couldn't play in the game on Sunday. I, because I reported two days earlier, I could play in the game on Sunday and did play. So uh, I, don't, I, I don't think, I mean, I, the overwhelming majority of them didn't hold anything against me, uh, but there were a few players and prominent players too uh, that not only held something against me, you know, I would say even until just a few years ago held that grudge against me. Getting back to the playing field, is there one catch that you made that stands out in your career? You know, not one catch, but there's one tackle, uh, and that was against Mike Card and the Denver Broncos. If you remember, it was, I think, 1987. Uh, we were playing in Denver. Maybe it was 88. Uh, we were playing in Denver. We played home and home with the Broncos. In a September game, I ran a 12-yard post route, and Dave Craig hung the ball. And uh, Mike Harden got to me just before the ball did, and he hit me in the head with a forearm and uh, bit me over backwards, and I was out before I hit the ground. I didn't, I didn't remember hitting the ground. In fact, the ball came down and landed on my chest and rolled off, and I didn't even know it. Um, and he was fined, I think the league fined him $5,000 and all that kind of stuff, which was a lot of money back then. It's not much now. Um, but then we played him in Seattle in December. It was like the next last game of the year, and it was an ESPN game. And uh, he intercepted a ball in the end zone, came out of the, came back out of the end zone running the ball, and I was on the other side of the field. And uh, I just drew a beeline right for his chest. And uh, I, I, got a, I got a great tackle, and, uh, uh, and, and the rest is history. But... Uh, uh, I'll, I'll never forget that uh, tackle that I made uh, in the NFL. 
We talked to Mike Haynes uh, last month, and he was laughing about Stickham. He said the reason they outlawed in the NFL was because they were going through too many footballs. When you, <laughs> when you played against the Raiders, who had the pleasure of covering you? Was it Mike Haynes or Lester Hayes? Well, it was both. Uh, but, I mean, they were both equally good quarter cornerbacks. Mike, of course, is in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Lester's not, but they were both very, very good. You know, Lester Hayes played linebacker at Texas A&M. So he was a, a big cornerback, a uh, strong quarterback, but he could run too. And uh, they were both very difficult to uh, play against. But uh, I played against Lester before Mike was traded from New England to the Raiders. And Lester loved to wear that stick. And every time you played against him, I'd end up being covered in that stick of him because he had it on his hands and his, his wrists and his shoes and his socks. And uh, so, so if you played against him and, and they played by bump and run coverage, uh, you got it all over you. I'd say it was, it was a, I'd, I'd get grass and all that stuff sticking to me. I mean, it was gross, but uh, uh, it was just, it was is is part of the tradition that uh, Lesser uh, he he felt like that he he could catch the the ball, the ball better on interceptions if he wore it because Fred Blitikoff had it. So uh, so he he was going to wear it too. Right, right. Was there one player or one team that gave you the most trouble? You know, I would say it was the Raiders. Uh, we played them twice a year, and this was back in their heyday when they when they were you know that Lala Zeta and Mike Haynes, uh, Matt, Matt Millen, all these guys guys uh, were, were playing, and they were uh, at the zenith of their careers. They were very very difficult uh, defense to play. Offensive, they're very well too, very good too. When they got got Marcus Allen, and then then they go to the Super Bowl. So uh, they were always a real difficult team for us to play. The thing I wish wish would have happened, I know you won in politics, is that you would have won for governor of Oklahoma and Lynn, Lynn Swan would have won for, for governor of Pennsylvania. And see you, you guys there in those, those meetings in Washington. That would have been really interesting. It would have been. Uh, you, you know, I knew that uh, Lynn ran, ran, I think, two years after I ran, or maybe four years. So I, I can't remember. But, um, you know, I was really pulling for him that, that, that uh, Pennsylvania would... would uh, Jump behind his campaign, but it just didn't work out. And same with me, I, you know, I lost by 6,500 votes, and um, I haven't thought about being a political candidate since then, and and I don't intend to. If you had attended Oklahoma University, you might yeah, have right, more. <laughs> yeah, that was a mistake. I went back to high school. <laughs> You're right. When you went into the Hall of Fame, what was your thoughts? Just that it was it was like a dream. Uh, you know, I'd never really thought of myself as a as a Hall of Fame player. Um, I'd never uh, let myself imagine uh, that big of a dream for myself. So it really was, um, it was extremely fun, uh, extremely gratifying and rewarding, but I've always looked at it as an honor that I've shared with my teammates, my coaches, and, and the organization that uh, helped me get there. It seems inevitably when people described you as a player, they said, um, you know, the guy was average size, average speed. Are they underselling your talents? Uh, no, I would say I was, I think I was average size and average speed as well. But, you know, I was a guy, they, they used to describe it this way, uh, that I could play well in a phone booth. Uh, meaning I didn't have the breakaway speed of a James Lofton or John Jefferson. Uh, but if I needed to get open, of course, we needed to, catch a seven yard pass or a 15 yard pass i could get open uh and catch the ball if the quarterback got it there and uh you know that's that's kind of the role i played uh in seattle and, and it's really surprising you know the passing game is totally different today than it was when i played but you know i i averaged uh over 16 yards a catch uh and at the time i held the records for the most yards and most catch uh in a, in a career so uh, to average over 16 yards um, on every catch that I had is pretty amazing when you consider that I'm, I was the guy known as the too small, too slow guy. How many yards do you have in today's game the way these defenses basically can't do anything to the receivers? You, you know, that that's really true. And I, I say uh, hurrah, because I, I love to see a great passing game. And uh, if you can't throw the ball today, you can't win. Um, and so I, I love to see that too. Uh, everybody throws the ball, puts it up in the air a lot. They put a lot on the quarterback. Uh, quarterbacks have more responsibility and more pressure on them today than ever before, uh, because of this emphasis on the passing game. Um, so, 
uh, it's it's really fun to watch. I would have loved to play in in the modern uh, day offense that they play today. Um, but I, you know, even at that, I, I the fact that I didn't get to don't get to play in it, I get to watch it, and that's a lot of fun. Now you're known for having gone over the middle. Did you ever think to yourself, just for one game or one play, I'd like to have that Bob Hayes type speed where I could just <laughs> you know dash down the field. <laughs> well, you know, um, what's interesting is, is what you find, what I found was those guys that are really, really fast, um, they didn't really like going over the middle. And I was just one of those guys that wasn't very fast but didn't mind going over the middle. I, I didn't love it. Nobody loves getting their brains beat out. But, um, you know, I, I could make a living there, and uh, I did. So, uh, you know, I, you know, there's there's a place for – Every style and every fashion and every form of a of an NFL receiver, and I had one style and I I I tried to maximize it, but you know no I I, I don't think I ever uh, I didn't play the game of wishing for something that I knew I could never have anyway. Tell you what, you showed me being a slow white guy that if you had the desire and the dedication, you could be successful, and become a top player in the NFL. Well, you know, I, I, I say this to young people, including my own young people, my four kids all the time, that uh, don't let other people limit your desire or your ability. Um, you know, just make the most of what you've got, and uh, you'll surprise yourself, and you'll surprise a whole heck of a lot of other people as well. And that wraps up another edition of Sports and Torts with David Spada and Elliot Harris on TalkZone.com. It also wraps up another year. I want to thank today's guest, Shannon the 2013 Loop Rock Girl, and Pro Football Hall of Famers Dan Deerdorf and Steve Largent. I'd also like to thank our executive producer, Dave Olson, and I'd like to thank everybody who has tuned in this past year and years past to listen and view and hopefully enjoy. We'll look forward to a healthy, happy, and prosperous new year for each and every one of you. Thank you.